If you've ever thought of quilting your own projects but just don't know where to start, I have the perfect first steps for you. I've put together a PDF guide. I call it Three Steps Toward Freehand Freedom. These are the baby steps, but they can help you move past your overwhelm and show you that, yes, indeed, freehand quilting can be learned. So if you'd like to snag this PDF, there's a link in the show notes, or if you're an Instagram user, just message me three steps. That's the number three, S-T-E-P-S, and I'll send you that link. Let today be the day you get started. I love quilts that have lots of tiny little pieces. Those are my favorite to make. I love the intricate designs. I love the detail. Um, Those are the kind of quilts that make me happy. Welcome to Measure Twice, Cut Once, the podcast where we hear quilters and other crafters' stories and draw encouragement and even life lessons from them. I'm your host, Susan Smith, coming to you from my quilting studio, Stitched by Susan. This is where my long arm, Lucy, and I spend lots of hours doing freehand, edge-to-edge quilting. If you're not a quilter and those terms mean nothing to you, it's basically doodling on a quilt top with a 50-pound writing utensil with needle and thread at high speeds. So if you, by chance, are an aspiring quilter and maybe freehand is what you want to learn how to do, but it's a bit intimidating, I do invite you to check out my YouTube channel. It's also called Stitched by Susan. And there I host regularly what I call live and unscripted episodes. So they're streamed in real time and I work through projects. Often it is freehand quilting. Sometimes it'll be things like binding or pressing or other quilt related topics, but they are broadcast live. And so you're able to type in questions and I will actually answer them during the course of the show. So I invite you to join me there. So my philosophy is there's just nothing as warm and comforting as a handmade quilt. And so I aim to get as many out in the world as possible. So to that end, I quilt for people. And of course, I love teaching others to find freedom and joy in quilting for themselves. But there are so many quilt makers out there and just as many stories. Because quilting has been a bridge between generations. It has soothed loneliness or chronic pain. And it's been a really beautiful expression of art and creativity that has spanned countries and cultures. So joining me in the studio today to tell us her story is Alice Eikenberry. Today's Pins and Needles is brought to you by The Will and Dave Show. Hi, I'm the Will Half of the Will and Dave Show, a short little podcast that myself and the eponymous Dave like to record talking about the things that really matter to us, whether that's social, political, or pop culture. Usually we don't see eye to eye, but more often than not, we can find some common ground in there somewhere. And now, back to pins and needles with a quick tip for all you sharp quilters out there. In today's conversation with Alice, we're going to be talking a little bit about color selection, contrast, different ways that she pulls together a color palette for her quilts. But I have a tip for you that was given to me early on in my quilting endeavors. I was in a quilt shop. I was wanting to make a quilt that was red and white. And the proprietor of the shop, her name was Chris, gave me a lesson that has stuck with me all these years. And that is... Open up your borders. Invite all the relatives to the color party. So when I said red and white, she said, your quilt will look flat and stale if you just pick a narrow channel of reds, but open it wide up. Run the gamut. So bring in the raspberry pinky reds. Bring in the true reds. Bring in the barn reds. Bring in prints that even have black or burgundy in them, those deep, dark, rich reds. And that broad expanse of color is what will make your quilt come to life. It will have interest and depth. So I have never forgotten that lesson, so I pass that on to you. Invite all the relatives to the party. Don't be scared to invite the cousins. You all know I love my cup of coffee. So if you're interested in supporting this podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan, where for the price of a delicious coffee, you're able to make a one-time contribution, or if you wish, you can sign up for a monthly membership. And I'm currently running a special for that monthly membership where you will receive some limited edition copies of a few of my patterns if you choose to go for that membership. So check that out, buymeacoffee.com. Thanks for your support. We appreciate it so much. It enables my husband and I, he's the producer, 
to keep producing better and better quality on these podcasts. So we really appreciate it. And maybe take a moment now to refill your cup as you settle back to enjoy today's interview. Today, I'm glad to welcome Alice Eikenberry to the podcast. Thanks for coming, Alice. Thanks for having me. This is going to be so fun. Now, some months ago, you were gracious enough to host a little Zoom mini class for a friend and I talking about EPPing, and that was kind of where I first got to know you. I saw your wonderful quilt photos on Instagram, and I've been following you for a long time, so I'm hoping to hear lots of stories about EPPing today. But kind of going a little earlier, have you quilted for a long time? Is this a lifelong passion or is this something you've come into more recently? Well, I've loved quilts from the very beginning. My grandmothers and my mother um, all quilted and I absolutely just fell in love with quilts from as soon as I saw them. My grandmothers taught me how to hand stitch and uh, my mother mostly did utility type quilts. She didn't do a lot of specialty quilts. She just quilted with whatever fabric she could get. But I learned quilting from my grandmothers. Did you do hand quilting as well? You pieced by hand, but um, were they also hand quilters? My first quilt when I was around eight years old was hand stitched. And it's about 10 inches square with little square blocks. And my grandmother had me sitting in front of her on the floor in her home in Iowa. And she taught me how to hand stitch. And she was not an easy teacher. She was really particular. And if I didn't have my pieces match at the corners, she made me take it out. And at the time, it was frustrating for me. But I look back on that little square now, and I made it into a pillow. And each section matches perfectly. And that makes me know that started me in wanting to do real precise type work. I love that story. It's kind of kind of Laura Ingalls like. And mm-hmm. I always appreciate because I have a similar story, you know, of mothers and grandmothers that imparted their skill and I've always been appreciative of that. Yes. So when did you first meet English paper piecing and what was it about it that attracted you so much? Well, that was about um I think five years ago now. I was shopping in my favorite quilt store in Walla Walla called Stash. And I was just really getting back into quilting after quite a long uh, break. And the owner of the store, Kathy, showed me this beautiful little box. And it was um, Tulip Pink's marquee kit. And I just loved the box. I opened the box and everything was all cut perfectly. And I had the papers and I hadn't done English paper piecing before. And she talked me into getting it. And I brought it home and it sat and it sat and it sat because I just thought, I don't think I can do this. And one day I finally got it out and started and I could not stop. It just, it made me so happy. I was thrilled to be making something with my hands, um, hand stitching versus machine, uh, something I never thought that I'd be able to do. And when I finished that quilt, it was the beginning of where I am now. I absolutely adore English paper piecing. I love that. And I wonder if some of that harkens back to your the lesson from your grandmother of, you know, intricacy and preciseness, because that's one of the beauties of EPP is that the corners match, you know, the seam, the lengths of the seam match perfectly. And I think that's what attracts lots of people to it. It is so precise and you can do intricate, intricate things with it. And you hit it right on. That's exactly the way I felt. I do a fair amount of machine piecing or I used to in my past. And frankly, I'm not that good at it. It takes me a long time. And because I'm so picky about making sure my seams match, um, it is a little frustrating for me at times. And so with English paper piecing, everything is precise and it lets you work on the most intricate designs that there's no way I could ever do by machine. A lot of people prefer to hand stitch over EPP. And I've tried hand stitching and I'm, I don't have it down yet. Um, so a lot of people all, all by by that do you mean hand stitching what would typically be a machine stitched quilt you know with the straight seams and the regular yes. intersections okay gotcha yes, yes. and um, I've tried to hand stitch versus EPP in some of the intricate designs and it's just not it's not for me I find it quicker for me to do English paper piecing rather than cutting out precise pieces of fabric than um, marking your lines the marking takes so long for me 
-hmm. And EPP, you don't have to be as precise when you cut your pieces out because you fold it over a piece of paper. So Right. So there's where the perfection comes in those pieces is the yes. foundation, the papers yes. that guide you to create the perfectly shaped piece. Got it. And being able, I love quilts that have lots of tiny little pieces. Those are my favorite to make. I love the intricate designs. I love the detail. Um, those are the kind of quilts that make me happy. Wonderful. So how, how many EPP quilts have you done now? Oh, dear. At a guess. I've been doing it now for about five years, and I would say I have done probably around 20. Wow. 20, between 20 and 25. One of those was a wall hanging. Some of them are wall-type quilts rather than bed quilts, but I've made a lot of really large ones too. Mm -hmm. So four to five quilts a year. That's amazing. Yes. Yes. So do you hand quilt these projects then, or do you have them quilted in another way? I've hand quilted a few of them, but because there's so many quilts I want to make, I've been sending them out for machine quilting, mostly by Teresa Silva, and you've done um, some for me. Um, I'd rather be making quilts than quilting them, um, but there are a few that I felt did need to have hand quilting, so I've done those. Mm -hmm. That's one Not of the very things, many. One of the things I love about your story, Alice, your journey, is that you have zeroed in on the things that you love doing and find joy in. So it's not about, I have to hand quilt because I hand pieced it. It's about, you know what you love. You love the intricacy of the EPP and you love the piecing portion and you're happy to let someone else do the quilting portion. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, note to self, do the bits that you love. It is a hobby. It is a joy, right? And that's the intention. And that's the part I like is the piecing. Very cool. So one of the other joys that you've mentioned in some of your online posts is the creation or the finding maybe of a quilting community really worldwide of people who love the same types of things that you do or enjoy the same types of quilts. How have you found that? And what are, oh have you got any great stories there of people you've met online? Oh my goodness. I joined, I had to go back before this interview to find out how long I've been on Instagram and I joined a little over four years ago, not knowing what it was um, at all, and just slowly learning about other quilters that were online, and then zeroing in on quilters that just blew me away. And you're right, they're from all over the world. And not only do I learn so much from their stories and the quilts that they design and make, but I'm also just amazed at what I learn about the other countries and cultures and, you know, cooking. I love cooking too, so I've made quilting cooker, cooking friends, um, the inspiration that I get from Instagram is almost not, um, a, I'm not a, almost able not to describe it because there's no way I would have tried to make or even known about so many of the quilts that I make had it not been for the Instagram community. And it's just a wonderfully supportive, um, creative and loving group. And I'm so glad to be part of it. I'm curious, the, have you found access to fabrics and supplies that are different from what we might have available in the U.S.? I have. A lot of the quilts um, that I really do love and I'm starting to do more of are the mostly European type quilts where we don't sell the fabrics or the patterns or the, even some of the paper pieces. So I, I've gotten some from England. I've gotten a lot from the Netherlands, um, some from Japan. A lot from Australia. They're a huge quilting community. Things that we just don't have here or often just can't source. If That's you, beautiful. If you... It's so amazing that our borders, if you will, can expand like that to reach across the world in ways we might, as you said, might not have known about at all if it weren't for social media and following those have. leads. Yeah. There's no way I would have and known the, the, the amazing people that I've made friends with. We share fabrics. We share... Um, patterns. Um, we share ideas. It's an everyday thing for me and it absolutely makes my day. I love that. And speaking for myself, I appreciated the little mini informal lesson that I alluded to earlier on. You were so gracious to to give my friend and I a little bit of your time. We were absolute novices 
at English Paper Piecing. And so you just showed us some of the simple tools and first steps. So maybe some of our listeners are in that position too. Do you have any recommendations either for a pattern to start with or maybe a designer that they should follow and check out or a YouTube channel? Where would people even start to explore? Yes. Well, when I started mine before I was on Instagram, I think where it really got me going was the Facebook group for Willie Hammerstein's quilts. She's the, the one that her designs just immediately took hold in my mind. And the Facebook group is run by a, a woman in New Zealand who is absolutely wonderful. She answers questions and the people in the group help you when you are stuck with colors or fabric selection. Um, don't be afraid to try a pattern that you like if you're going to English paper piece. A lot of people will start with a hexagon quilt, which is a good way to start um, just to get used to the stitches and holding the pieces and um, basting them. And after you do something as simple as a hexi quilt, um, don't be afraid to start another one. My second quilt was a Willie Hammerstein quilt. It was a La Paz, and it was very intricate, and I just wasn't sure I was ever going to do it. And once I started it, my goodness, there's nothing different from doing a hexi quilt except your pieces are, are a different shape. Um, a key, though, is doing the more intricate patterns is your fabric selection. Uh, um, okay. And those quilts that I made with um, Willie Hammerstein absolutely taught me how to contrast fabrics, how to mix fabrics, and how to make multiple pieced quilts come out balanced. And so making those kind of quilts was a really good lesson for all of my future quilts. It took away a lot of my anxiety and it's made me much more aggressive and assertive in my fabric choices. Um, just don't be afraid to start. There's help out there. There's people that, you know, you can ask a question and you'll get 50 different answers from 50 different people from all over the world. Um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So have you found that to be a real journey? Can you look back at your earlier quilts and say, oh boy, if I was doing that again, I would have picked different colors or maybe not even different, but you can just see how your color taste has evolved over time? Absolutely. Um, I've learned that the more fabrics, the better they are. I started out with a limited number of fabrics and colors in the quilts that I, that I made first. And now I put in everything. I go through my stash and just pick out things that, you know, I, I wouldn't think originally would have, have worked. And now I just find that the more fabrics, the more beautiful the quilt comes out in the same color tones. Mm -hmm. Like if I have a section with yellows and blues, I'll use every single piece, a different yellow and blue versus the same yellows and blues in the section. I love that. And I would not have thought of that. I probably play within, you know, too narrow of a, too narrow of a boundary. Yes. So expand your playground. Good to know. Yes. Good to know. So what, what maybe, well, some of the questions that I think that people ask just based on your feed and some of the feedback that you get questions like, how do you store your quilts? Do you fold them? How do you fold them? What do you do with them when they're finished? Well, right now, um, the last quilts that I've made over the, the, mostly the EPP quilts, I've turned my formal living room into a quilt storage um, and display area. Let's call that so a have, gallery. It's what it is. Let's it's call a gallery. It an art gallery. <laughs> <laughs> it's a room that we rarely use. And I have three quilt ladders in there that are full. I have a church pew that is folded with fabrics and then I have little baskets and things that I roll them up or store them in and I move them around and change them up. I don't like to keep them folded or displayed in any one position for very long. I do have some quilts um, in the guest room and the master bedroom but I have cats so I can't put any quilt out where we you know like on a couch or on a chair. On a flat unless it's on, mm -hmm. Yeah because they'll sit on it and they're not allowed. So it's limited in my house, even though I have a lot of quilts, um, they are limited in where I'm able to store them. So one of the tips I caught in there then is to refold your quilts along different lines, right? Every yes. so often, a few times yes. a year, maybe. Is that yes. good advice? And yeah. 
then I also started rolling them so they don't have any ah. creases mm -hmm. and then roll them up and put them in a little basket or something like that. Do you have a favorite type of batting that you typically put in your quilts or have you experimented with different things? Well, for the machine quilts, machine quilted quilts that Teresa does, they're mostly wool. When I hand quilt, I like to use bamboo. I used a bamboo on a Liberty Hexi quilt that I made and it's just a beautifully soft batting. Bamboo Teresa has, uses, a very, has a very gentle drape to it, doesn't it? Very flexible. It does. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. What is it that you love about the wool in the machine quilted projects? The wool is, it gives the um, quilting much more definition. It's, she usually uses a double layer in the, the smaller size quilts. And the definition of the machine quilting just shines with right. the wool. Because and it's, it's a so heavier, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a heavier quilt too. So it's a really nice and warm quilt. Um, and it holds its shape really nicely. Good to know. Beautiful. Well, I have a couple quick questions for you, and they're not tough ones, I promise. They're kind of multiple choice, just so we can get to know your style a little bit. When it comes to choosing fabrics, do you tend toward the subtle look or the more bold? Boy, I've been struggling with that very thing lately because most of my quilts in the past couple of years have been very bright and vivid quilts. A lot of Tulip Pink, Anna Marie Horner. And I love those, but I also love the vintage look and the old look. So I'm working on one right now with reproduction fabrics. It's the Jane Austen um, quilt. And they're the old, old fabrics that have the beautiful florals and birds and light colors. And I'm absolutely loving doing that. Yes, I'm also so making Susan Smith's Stonesfields quilt. And I'm, it's mostly applique, but I've been doing a lot of the squares I'll put in a, an EPP tiny figure instead. But hers is mostly hand-pieced, and I, I'm going to machine piece those pieces together. But it's all in, um, I'm making the Susan Smith Stonefields all in Tilda fabric, Beautiful. which is also a subtle, you know, soft color. And just to clarify for our listeners, it's not me, Susan Smith. I know it'll come as a big surprise to know there's more than one of us out there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. A couple more questions. When you're basting your EPP, are you a thread baster or a glue baster? I am a glue baster through and through. When I first made my first one, I didn't know about glue pins and I hand basted it, which is okay. I don't mind hand basting. But then I was watching, this is again, really early in my EPP journey. I was watching a Tula Pink video and I looked at her pieces and this is how naive I was just a few years ago. I looked at the pieces that she had been displaying about how she was joining them up and I could not figure out how in the world she attached them to the papers. And I sent her a message and I said, what did you do? You didn't hand baste. And she just, she wrote me back and she said, glue guns, baby, all the way. <laughs> How nice. So you, so you got, typically use a glue pen, right? Which is, I think it's by Soline and it's specially yeah. made for this. I know I've read yeah. about people that use other brands, other types of glue and there's fours and against, but the pen is certainly specially sized and fabricated for this. Yes. I mostly use Soline because those are mostly available in the, I, I buy them in bulk. I usually have around a hundred of them in, in my house at any given time. And, um, I've tried the other brands. They don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with them. I've used them and they work fine. I've tried the Elmer's glue sticks mm -hmm. that you can get at the, you know, dollar store and they're too large. I, I can't do my little pieces with those very well. Right. They're so unwieldy. I, it's like trying to do tiny work with two big thumbs, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, do you have a favorite thimble, leather, silicone, metal, or do you even use a thimble when you're stitching? I've tried every thimble I can come up with, and I just don't like them. I haven't found one that feels comfortable. So I use those little finger pads that you can get. I think they're like a mole skin. And then there's also a, a heavier one called dots. And I use those on my middle finger that I use to push my needle through. Great tip. See, that was not even in my questions because I didn't even know about that. So that's something yes. I do know about. I'll see if I can find some of your favorite tools and pop links into the show notes too. Okay. okay. So where can folks find you, especially on Instagram? That's kind of where you um, live with your photographs. Where can folks find you to see pictures of your work? Um, it's Home with Alice. It's my Instagram name. 
Perfect. Or just put in Alice Eikenberry. Okay, perfect. And I will put links to that as well in the show notes. I do encourage listeners to have a look at Alice's feed. Her quilts are absolutely gorgeous. So final question then. I always ask my guests, what's a little nugget that they want to share with our listeners? Either something you've learned about yourself or about the craft or something tough that your quilt making has helped you through. What's a little nugget you'd like to leave with our listeners? Well, I've been retired for about 11 years and I've always been very, very active in doing things and doing projects. And I frankly don't know what I would do if I couldn't quilt. Um, It gives me my successes for each day. As far as the quilting um, itself, I think the biggest things I've learned, which I talked about a little earlier, is using multiple fabrics in the same color and contrast. Um, Contrast, I can't stress enough. When you're making um, intricate patterns, it's not so much as matching your colors and making one section look good. It's the contrast between the pieces that you choose so that you can really show off the design. That's a great tip. So as you're scrolling through Alice's feed, I encourage you to look for that in in her photographs and maybe even look for the growth of that skill um, over time in Alice's EPP journey. Thank you so much for joining me today. It has been a real pleasure. Thank you, Susan. And thank you for tuning in to the show. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice. It really helps other listeners to find the show so they can hear these stories too. For information on the classes I offer or quilting services, please see my website, stitchedbysusan.com. And if pictures are your preference, check out my Pinterest galleries of edge-to-edge and custom quilting projects. These direct links can all be found in the show notes below. So until next time, may your sorrows be patched and your joys be quilted.